Welcome to everyone, and thank you for joining us for this presentation on long-termism brought to you by the Centre for Inquiry Canada. I'm Shauna Watson, Vice President of CFIC. I just have a few announcements before we get started. While we meet today on a virtual platform, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the lands which we call home. From coast to coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of all the Inuit Métis and First Nations peoples. We also acknowledge that not all people came here as migrants and settlers, recognizing also those who were brought involuntarily as enslaved people or by means of human trafficking, and we pay tribute to those ancestors and to their descendants. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility to improve relationships between nations, peoples, and cultures, to acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and to consider how we can each try to move forward in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. In the interest of distributing and widely disseminating information such as the topic of today's talk, we are not requiring payment or membership for people to attend, as we think this sort of information is important for everyone. CFIC is an educational charity promoting human rights, science, and critical thinking. In order to support this work, our operation relies on funds from memberships and donations. If you can help, even a little, please visit our website at the URL I will post in the chat window. All donations are tax receivable. This talk is being recorded for publication on CFIC's YouTube channel. If this is a concern for you, please turn off your video. You are also welcome to replace your name with a pseudonym. Following the talk, we'll be accepting written questions using the Zoom chat feature, which you can find at the bottom of your Zoom window. Please keep your questions short and to the point. We've enabled access for everyone to the Zoom chat to collect questions and also for people to post if they are having technical issues. In all cases, we expect participants to be respectful of the speaker and of other audience members. Now I will introduce you to our speaker. Emil Torres is a philosopher and historian whose work focuses on human extinction and civilizational collapse. They are a contributing writer at Salon, have published in outlets like Aeon and the Washington Post, and wrote the first ever textbook on existential risks, or risks that could destroy humanity's future. Their forthcoming book, Human Extinction, A History of the Science and Ethics of Annihilation, offers a sweeping survey of how our thinking about human extinction has evolved over time, from the ancient Greeks to the present. Welcome, Emil. Thanks so much for having me. This is great. <laughs> All right, should I go ahead and start? Yes, please start. Great. So um, as mentioned, the uh, talk is, is titled Long-Termism, How Bad Would Human Extinction Be? Um, you can follow me on Twitter if, uh, if you find this interesting. Um, there's my website. All right, so let's get into it. Um, so, sorry, give me just one second here, okay. Um, okay, so what is long-termism? Long-termism is, it, the first thing to say is long-termism is an ideology that goes way beyond just long-term thinking. Uh, and we will discuss how that's the case uh, momentarily. So right now, it's it has a really enormous uh, influence in the world. Uh, I would describe it as as quite possibly, at least within the the, the Western world, uh, is the most influential ideology that most people have never heard about. Uh, at least that's the case until recently, uh, with the push to promote uh, Will McCaskill's new book, uh, "What We Owe the Future," which is intended to be something like you know the authoritative text on long termism, the Bible of long termism, uh, if you will. And that's you know backed by literally millions of dollars in uh, just promotional uh, money. So, um, so you may have seen it, you know, all over the New York Times, New Yorker, BBC, uh, all of those outlets have covered it. Uh, there's also you know, a, a recent UN Dispatch article which says, uh, "quote the foreign policy community in general and the United Nations in particular beginning to embrace long-termism." Uh, right now, the community behind long-termism called effective altruism has an enormous $46.1 in committed funding. Uh, long-termism is ubiquitous within the tech industry. 
And in fact, tech billionaires uh, or crypto billionaires like Elon Musk and Sam Bankman-Fried uh, have explicitly described themselves as long-termists. So Sam Bankman-Fried has even uh, just uh, earlier this year gave $11 million to a long-term congressional candidate named Carrick Flynn, uh, who was campaigning in, in Oregon. Uh, his campaign was run by an individual at the Future of Humanity Institute, which is a long-termist organization founded by the long-termist Nick Bostrom uh, in 2005. So let's um, turn to the question uh, of whether human extinction would be bad or wrong. So first of all, to understand this question, it may be um, useful to, uh, to begin with, with disambiguating the question. What, what does it mean? So it, this looks like a simple question, but in fact, it's really not. There's all sorts of hidden complexity uh, buried within uh, this, this otherwise um, straightforward question. So for example, human could be understood in at least five different ways. There are at least six types of extinction that are ethically and evaluatively relevant. For our purposes, will take human to mean uh, homo sapiens. Uh, this is probably the most obvious uh, definition, but there are many other definitions. On the one hand, uh, for example, in the, the, the very nascent <clears throat> excuse me, literature on uh, the ethics of human extinction, many people mean by human, they mean uh, not just homo sapiens, but all of the descendants that come after us. Uh, there's an even more expansive definition, which is just Earth-originating intelligent life. Uh, so many long-termists have have used this particular uh, uh, definition. Uh, it might you might also take human to mean our humanity. Uh, you know this this sort of like you know special quality uh, that's maybe grounded in our dignity or our aut autonomy, freedom, and so on. Uh, and hence, when one talks about human extinction, one could mean the loss of uh, of this kind of um, you know, fundamental quality that is common among all human beings uh, around the world. Uh, so, okay, with respect, again, so we'll just take human to mean homo sapiens. Uh, with respect to extinction, this could have at least six uh, different meanings. Um, as I mentioned before, for our purposes, let's define it as what would happen if and only if there were no more members of Homo sapiens in the universe. This remained the case forever, and we left behind no successors. So we'll call this final extinction. There are three conditions that need to be satisfied. Completeness, so there are just no more individual members of Homo sapiens in the universe. Permanence, that stays the case forever. And finality, the human story uh, terminates along with the end of uh, uh, human, uh, Homo sapiens. So just to, to provide some perspective, uh, there are other kinds of uh, extinction one could talk about that are ethically and evaluatively relevant. For example, terminal extinction would just be the first two conditions there, completeness and permanence. But it's really since the 20th century, there are a number of people who have started to uh, explore the possibility of, you know, our species disappearing, but we leave behind some successors. And perhaps these successors carry on our values or civilization. Um, you know, enterprises like science, um, some of which we'll discuss a, a little bit later, the arts, morality, and so on. Um, and yeah, so that's another sense of, uh, of human extinction. There's also phyletic extinction, whereby we disappear, not because our evolutionary lineage terminates, but because we simply evolve into a, a new species. Uh, in this, the same way that, you know, Homo heidelbergensis, uh, evolved into at least three different species, Denisovans, uh, Neanderthals, and Homo sapiens. So they're extinct, but it's not because the that uh, lineage uh, terminated. All right, so with that in mind, now that we're somewhat clear about what type of human and extinction we're talking about, uh, we will return to the question, would the final, uh, a sort of precisified question, would the final extinction of Homo sapiens be bad or wrong? And here I think it's really important to distinguish between uh, two different stages, we could call them, uh, of extinction. So the first one is the process or event of going extinct. Uh, the second is the state or condition of being extinct. 
And what divides them is we could just call it, that's the moment of, of extinction. So obviously you can see here the on the um, y-axis, you've got human population is declining over time. We're going extinct. And then the moment at which there are no more instantiations of Homo sapiens in the, the universe, that's the moment of extinction. And then there's the, the subsequent period after that. Um, so let's see. So yeah, there's an analogy with um, personal death that philosophers have discussed in the scholarly literature, uh, which points to two possible reasons that uh, individual death might be bad. One is the process or event of dying might be painful, might involve suffering, uh, something of that sort. Then there's also the, the subsequent state of, of being dead, uh, which might be bad because it's um, it entails that there are all sorts of uh, you know potential experiences that are are missed out on you know future happiness uh, and so on and so that's yet another reason that personal extinction could be bad so you could then sort of map that onto the case of the extinction of humanity as well two reasons you might see final extinction is bad one is because the process or event of going extinct is bad second because being extinct uh, itself is bad for some reason. And so these are not uh, mutually exclusive, of course. You can say going extinct is bad, but also being extinct is bad. Or you might just pick one um, as the reason for extinction being bad. So um, taking these in order, you might first ask uh, why or under what conditions would going extinct be bad? This is sort of a, a question about what are the various scenarios of going extinct? Obvious ones are like nuclear holocaust, global pandemic, asteroid impact, uh, a volcanic super eruption, maybe you know some advanced uh, machine superintelligence uh, takes over the world and you know converts us all into paper clips. Uh, a scenario that's been discussed by some long termists. Uh, maybe there are self -replic replicating nanobots. Those are a bit more speculative. Uh, a physics disaster, you know, high powered physics uh, experiment that goes wrong. Or it, it could be the case that our extinction is brought about not by a catastrophe, but as a result of, let's say, every person on the planet, or at least a sufficient number of people on the planet, uh, refusing to have children. So perhaps they've read their Schopenhauer, who you can see uh, on the screen here, and have decided that, yes, life is, is suffering, and therefore uh, it would be better you know, to, paraphrase, to paraphrase Schopenhauer that uh, uh, that Earth becomes as, as lifeless as the moon. So that's that's an improbable uh, going extinct scenario, but it's nonetheless one that, at least for theoretical reasons, is worth registering. Um, and so we can, so let's see, here, here's the thing that virtually everybody would agree about, except maybe the most uh, sadistic individuals. If human extinction comes about because of a catastrophe, it would be bad at the very least because of that. Uh, this just follows from the fact that catastrophes are by definition more or less bad. Uh, hence, going extinct would be bad if caused by catastrophe. So I would call this the default view. The default view because it's a view that virtually everybody would accept. Anyone who thinks a catastrophe is bad is gonna think that human extinction caused by catastrophe is very bad. So that's the default view. Um, so then there are basically two um, positions that one could uh, hold. I think I might have missed a slide here. Um, let's see, sorry. Um, so there are two positions that one could hold. Uh, oh, sorry, yeah, so this, the, the, the one reason one might find human extinction to be bad is because going extinct is bad. The other is, is they would point to this subsequent state or condition of being extinct as bad. So why would uh, that be the case? Well, one reason is that there are opportunity costs. So I gestured at this earlier, uh, in the case of uh, individual death, that there are all sorts of experiences, happiness, and so on that one would miss out on if one died uh, prematurely. Um, so in the case of humanity, you might ask, well, what are the opportunity costs there? Answers could be 
you. Uh, one is that maybe being extinct would entail that certain unfinished business remains forever unfinished. Uh, this is this is the the unfinished business argument that people have uh, articulated in the literature. So, what would um, an example be? Well, the most obvious example maybe would be science. Perhaps uh, science is a teleological enterprise, and there is some point in the future when we will devise a complete, not just a not just a theory of everything. You know, the the theory that uh, brings together quantum field mechanics, uh, quantum field theory, and uh, and general relativity but also maybe a theory of everything. So that every type of phenomenon in the universe has some, uh, can be explained and predicted uh, in some sort of robust way. And so if we go extinct prematurely, then we'll never develop this theory and that would be bad. Uh, another reason is maybe it's not the case that science is a teleog teleological enterprise, but its value lies in further development. So maybe th there is no end to the de development of science, but um, nonetheless, there, there is a certain progress, if only backwards looking uh, progress that we make over time and that itself is valuable. And so by being extinct, we lose out on that value. The same could be said about uh, the arts, uh, morality. It could very well be the case as some philosophers have argued that uh, morality, for example, uh, is in the ver very early stages of its development. That you know, it really hasn't been. It's only been since the 1960s that uh, non-religious ethics, normative ethics, has been uh, studied in a systematic manner by by many philosophers. So perhaps we're just at the very dawn of sort of understanding what the right moral uh, perspective is. And one last uh, important, very important uh, possible opportunity cost is that there'd be no more future people. And this could be bad for two reasons. One is that it has to do with this idea that bringing people into existence uh, could be a benefit to them. So every time you create a new person, assuming that they will have a life that is worth living, you are doing something good for them. So for the same reason that you might uh, want to benefit uh, an already existing human being, uh, doing something good for them, you know, in, uh, enhancing their, their level of happiness, you might also decide to actually bring someone into existence uh, as well. So, so that's one reason. Another reason is that you might think that the more people there are with at least half decent lives in the universe, the better the universe becomes. So this is a bigger is better view accepted by uh, total utilitarians, uh, going back all the way to Henry Sidgwick in the, the 18th century, he was the first one to, uh, to sort of note this. Um, so on this perspective, a universe with 100 billion, trillion, trillion people is just better than a universe with only, quote unquote, uh, 100 billion people in it. So by going extinct uh, and therefore then uh, being extinct, we lose out on the opportunity to flood the universe with all sorts of value, they're, they're by making the universe itself more valuable. Also, so one might hold that Homo sapiens itself, perhaps because it's a unique uh, uh, aspect of the universe. You know, the, we're the only creatures we know of that are rational and moral and are capable of, of gazing up at the firmament uh, in awe and wonderment, that the universe would in some sense be impoverished without us. Uh, perhaps in the same way that, you know, the, the earth uh, or biosphere is impoverished by the loss of species. So those are so th those are two reasons uh, that one might view human extinction as bad. That being said, there are two positions that one could take uh, with respect to the question of whether or not our extinction would be uh, would be bad. Um, both of these would be answering yes. So there, I'm bracketing the possibility that one might answer this question, uh, no, it wouldn't be bad. Or perhaps one might say it would actually be good. Uh, maybe, you know, Schopenhauerian might hold that view. Uh, so I'm just focusing on the, the reasons for thinking it's bad. Um, the first one is, looks at going extinct and says, yes, 
I accept the default view. I hold that going extinct would be bad, at least insofar as it would cause people suffering and cut people's lives short. But here's the catch. Not only would it be bad, at least for these reasons, but it would be bad only for these reasons. So this is, this is what I would call an equivalence view, because it's saying that the badness or even the wrongness of human extinction is equivalent to the uh, badness or wrongness of going extinct. It's reducible to that without remainder. There's nothing else to say. So this has the radical implication of saying that uh, if going extinct doesn't involve suffering or premature death, then there's nothing bad about our extinction at all, full stop. So earlier we talked about, you know, most of these, the going extinct uh, scenarios involve catastrophes. The equivalence, people who accept the equivalence view would say, okay, yes, extinction is really bad for those reasons. But if everybody were to stop having children around the world, would that be bad? They would say no. So that is the equivalence view. The, the second general category of positions that one could take on this issue uh, focuses primarily on being extinct and says, yes, I also accept the default view, again, because just about everybody does. I hold that going extinct would be bad, at least insofar as it would cause people suffering and cut people's lives short. But there's much more to the story than that. Not only would it be bad, at least for these reasons, but it would be bad for reasons that go above and beyond whatever suffering and premature death is caused by going extinct. Some would add uh, that I think that uh, I think by far the worst part of our extinction arises from the opportunity costs. So whatever suffering and harm is involved in going extinct, uh, the opportunity costs of being extinct are so much greater. This has an, an its own radical implication, which is that in either case, it doesn't really matter how our extinction is brought about. Even if going extinct is 100% voluntary, it would still be very bad because of the further losses entailed by not existing anymore. So these are what I would call further loss views. Final human extinction is bad because our non-existence, however this happens, would entail further losses that are themselves bad, perhaps extremely bad. All right, so um, here we can see um, we have you know, equivalence views uh, and further loss views, both of which say the final extinction will be bad, but they say this for different reasons. So the answer to the question, yes, they focus on these two different aspects. So let's return then to uh, long-termism. So long-termism is, uh, let's see, I think I'll mention this in a second, is very much a further loss view. Um, what do they see as the losses? Pretty much everything that I had mentioned above. So the, the failure to you know, complete the scientific uh, project, the, um, the, the fact that the universe would lose something you know, special and unique. But in particular, a lot of long-termists point to the loss of future value by virtue of there being no, uh, no future people. So the argument is there could be lots of future people and these people could have lives that are half decent or better. So net positive in value or, uh, or more than that. Since the universe is made better by, uh, better the more people with half decent lives there are, our extinction would be bad because being extinct would mean the loss of these individuals. So then there's a question of, okay, being extinct is bad, how bad? If the number of future happy people, happy, quote unquote, meaning um, net positive, having net positive lives, if the number of, of future happy people could be enormous, then the badness of being extinct would increase in proportion. If the number is smaller, this would still constitute a further loss, but wouldn't be quite as bad. So this has inspired long-termists, such as uh, Nick Bostrom, perhaps, uh, most notably, um, it was the case that Nick Bostrom was the first to really ad address this issue uh, in any kind of depth. Uh, it's inspired them to try to figure out just how bad being extinct might be by estimating the opportunity cost measured in future human lives. Uh, you can see this, this is somewhat comically from the same uh, photo shoot. 
Um, so yeah, so in a, in a 2003 paper, which you can see here was titled Astronomical Waste, uh, Bostrom calculated that if we colonize the Virgo supercluster, so our, our cluster of galaxies, there could be at least 10 to the 23 biological humans per century. So to put that in perspective, there's been about 117 billion human beings who have uh, existed so far in anthropological history. So this is, this is a number that is many orders of magnitude greater than that. If these uh, future humans have lives that are net positive, that means there could exist enormous amounts of total value in the Virgo supercluster alone. But uh, hold on a second. So what if we were to colonize space? And here's another idea that he entertained. And instead of increasing uh, the number of biological humans in the future, we were to convert exoplanets into giant computer simulations, uh, um, basically to, to convert these planets into uh, a type of matter called computronium, which is you know, designed to optimize uh, computations. And then we were to run you know, these vast uh, virtual reality simulations in which enormous numbers of digital people live. Since you could fit more digital people in computer simulations than you could uh, biological humans on you know, terraformed uh, exoplanets, the result could be an even larger number of future people. So this led him to, to estimate a lower bound of at least 10 to the 38 digital lives per century in the Virgo supercluster if we colonize space and convert exoplanets into computronium uh, computers. So that's an even bigger number. Um, but the, the subsequent uh, calculations suggest that the, num the lower bound number could be even greater. So in 2013, in this paper titled Existential Risk Prevention is Global Priority, he calculated at least 10 to the 45 uh, digital life years within the entire accessible universe. Later in 2014, uh, in his, his uh, book, Bestseller, his book, Superintelligence, which was a bestseller, he calculated that there could be 10 to the 58 digital lives within the uh, accessible universe. So others have provided similar calculations. In a 2021 paper titled The Case for Strong Long-Termism, uh, the authors Will McCaskill and Hillary Graves uh, at, at Oxford, both um, borrowed a number from somebody else at uh, the institute that they work at, the Global Priorities Institute, uh, who um, calculated that there could be 10 to the 48 digital lives within the Milky Way galaxy alone. The point, though, as Bostrom wrote in 2003, is, to quote him, what matters for present purposes is not the exact numbers, but the fact that they are huge. <laughs> These are just enormous numbers. You know, it doesn't matter if they're off by, you know, a few orders of magnitude. Uh, they're massive. So consequently, the, the um, conclusion then is that the badness associated with being extinct, that is the opportunity cost, is absolutely extreme uh, since the further loss could be literally astronomically large. This is why on the long-termist view, final human extinction would be first, orders of magnitude worse than catastrophes causing widespread suffering, but which don't eliminate our species meaning that however terrible going extinct might be, uh, however much suffering that involves in a, you know, a nuclear winter, you know, people literally starving uh, in sub-freezing temperatures under pitch black skies uh, at noon. That's absolutely awful. But however bad that is, the opportunity cost just absolutely dwarfs all of that suffering. So that is the worst part of human extinction. Second implication is that um, even if the process or event of going extinct is completely voluntary and doesn't cause any suffering at all or any premature deaths, uh, extinction would still be very, very, very bad. So on this account, the details about being extinct are irrelevant. What matters is that the they uh, th those events, whether they're voluntary or whether they are catastrophic, result in the foreclosure of uh, all these future lives. So this idea uh, was first articulated by the utilitarian philosopher Henry Sidgwick in 1874. Uh, I mentioned Sidgwick earlier, uh, who wrote, quote, a universal refusal to propagate the human species 
would be the greatest of conceivable crimes from a utilitarian point of view. Uh, the utilitarian point of view is very uh, influential within the, the uh, long-termist community. So there's a question, is this view problematic at all? This long-termist further loss view that points primarily to being extinct uh, as the, the locus of badness of human extinction. Uh, should we be, be concerned that it is currently being embraced by billionaires, including some of the most powerful human beings on the planet, uh, that it's pervasive in the tech industry and infiltrating major uh, governing bodies like the UN? I would argue yes for many reasons. So they're both philosophical and practical arguments here. Philosophically, uh, it would. Uh, th th there's a question which many philosophers have uh, have asked and found to be a plausible um, philosophical objection to the long-termist view, which is: Would it really be bad if all these future biological or digital people are never born? If there's no one around to bemoan the non-existence of humanity, then who exactly would be harmed? Can you point to anyone? The, the answer is no. If somebody does not exist, then they can't be harmed in any way. They can't, uh, by not existing, they can't suffer anything um, precisely because they are in this strange metaphysical realm of the non-existent. Uh, it's even weird to, to refer to them as people. I mean, they're non-persons, they, they just don't exist. Um, furthermore, does creating more people, as many people as possible, with quote-unquote happy lives, really make the universe better? Do people matter because of the happiness we bring into the world? Or does happiness matter because of how it benefits people? So Jonathan Bennett, uh, Bennett uh, sort of famously in the late 1970s, has this nice quotable line in one of his critiques of this particular view, which is, uh, you know, the, the individuals who embrace this view see, uh, bemoan a situation not just where a person is lacking happiness, but where happiness is lacking a person. Um, so on the, the sort of utilitarian long-termist view, people are essentially just means to an end. Uh, the end being the maximization of value uh, within the universe as a whole. So even more sort of on the, the more uh, practical side, if one believes that it's really super important that as many of these future people come into existence as possible, this could lead to priorities that harm or neglect current people. Why is that the case? We'll just do the math. There are 8 billion people alive today, roughly 1.3 billion of whom are living in multidimensional poverty, but there could be 10 to the 58 digital people in the future. So now imagine you have finite resources and can either lift these individuals out of poverty or do something that increases the probability that all these people will come into existence uh, in, the, in the far future by a tiny amount. If you crunch the numbers, if you use expected value theory, uh, then the second, B, wins by far. It's just not even close. So your priority ought to be ensuring that these future people come into existence rather than helping people uh, today, because that is the way you're going to maximize total amount, uh, the, the total amount of value in the universe from our point now until the universe becomes uninhabitable, the heat death, you know, 10 to 100 years or whatever it is. Um, so this brings us to the notion of existential risk. Existential risk is, has a number of different definitions, but the one that's relevant here is basically any event that would prevent all of these future people from coming into existence. Millions, billions, trillions of years from now, assuming we colonize space and convert exoplanets into computronium computers. So in application of this um, was mentioned by Bostrom in his uh, 2013 paper, uh, where he's, he's referring to his uh, particular estimate of 10 to the 54 life years in the future. He says, even if we give this allegedly lower bound on the cumulative output potential of a technologically mature civilization, a mere 1% chance of being correct, we find that the expected value of reducing existential risk by a mere one billionth of one billionth of a percentage point is worth a hundred billion times as much as a billion human lives. So I know that's a lot, but basically you could imagine somebody, uh, you know, a, a Bostromian altruist who's sitting in front of two buttons, and if they push one, they're going to reduce existential risk by a, a teeny tiny amount, just a minuscule amount, uh, thereby 
uh, correspondingly increasing the probability that 10 to the 54 people come to exist in the far future. Or alternatively, on the second button, they could save the lives of a billion human beings who are actually living right now. Which should they push? Well, if they uh, listen to Bostrom, if they value the existence of these future people, uh, take seriously the, the estimates and so on, and then use expected value theory, the answer is absolutely obvious. They should push the first button, reduce existential risk uh, at the cost of you know, a, a billion human beings uh, perishing. So in a 2016 book by a Swedish uh, statistician named Ole Hagström, who himself is otherwise uh, sympathetic with the long-termist view, somewhat perplexingly, um, he provided this really nice uh, vignette of how taking the this Bostromian long-termist view seriously could have uh, really catastrophic consequences in the world. So I'll just read this quickly in full. So he says, it, referring actually to the um, quote that I just read from Bostrom, that expected value uh, claim, I feel extremely uneasy about the prospect that the calculations above might become recognized among politicians and decision makers as a guide to policy worth taking literally. It is simply too reminiscent of the old saying, if you want to make an omelet, you must be willing to break a few eggs, which has typically been used to explain that a bit of genocide or so might be a good thing if it can contribute to the goal of creating a future utopia. Imagine a situation where the head of the CIA explains to the US president that they have credible evidence that somewhere in Germany, which happens to be where I live, uh, so this is this is somewhat personal. There's a lunatic uh, who is working on a doomsday weapon and intends to use it to wipe out humanity, and that this lunatic has a one in a million chance of succeeding. They have no further information on the identity or whereabouts of this lunatic. If the president has taken Bostrom's argument to heart, and if he knows how to do the arithmetic, he may conclude that it is worthwhile conducting a full-scale nuclear assault on Germany to kill every single person within its borders. Uh, so I would contend that that's not good. Um, furthermore, I, the, the, the list here is, is actually quite long of sort of like the practical implications of taking this view seriously. So for example, Bostrom has argued that we may need to use preemptive violence in order to prevent an existential uh, catastrophe. Uh, again, a catastrophe that would result in the loss of all these future people. And that we should also seriously consider implementing a global surveillance, uh, global invasive surveillance system that monitors the actions of every person on the planet in order to prevent civilizational devastation, as he calls it, which could take the form of an existential catastrophe. Uh, so he, he uh, then elaborates on this particular scenario that he seems to, to be somewhat uh, enamored with, which is he calls the high-tech panopticon, uh, where everybody where is, is fitted with the freedom tag uh, and their every you know minute actions are tracked by the state. So this is very worrisome, I would argue, especially given that some of the most powerful humans on the planet, like Elon Musk, uh, seem to take Bostrom's long-termist worldview very seriously. In fact, Bostrom, um, Elon Musk even retweeted uh, a couple months ago Bostrom's astronomical waste uh, paper with the line, quote, likely the most important paper ever written. So recall that the astronomical waste paper was the one in which he calculated how many people could exist uh, if we were to uh, simulate enormous numbers of uh, individuals in the far future after colonizing space. So, but even putting these sort of like catastrophic uh, possibilities, um, the genocidal possibilities aside, uh, the Bostromian version of long-termism could lead people to ignore uh, or neglect or minimize or downplay non-existential problems facing people today, such as global poverty. So consider that he writes for example, in his um, in, a, in 2002, he wrote that the worst atrocities in history, including World War II, the AIDS pandemic, and so on, are, quote, mere ripples on the surface of the great sea of life, since they haven't significantly affected the total amount of human suffering or happiness or determined the long-term fate of our species. Uh, so if past atrocities are mere ripples, then you should have the same attitude towards future atrocities insofar as they aren't going to non-trivially increase the probability of an existential risk. Elsewhere, he writes that this could be taken to be 
uh, where elsewhere he writes where this could be taken to be a reference to things like global poverty, uh, climate justice, and so on, that quote, unrestricted altruism is not so common that we can afford to fritter away on a plethora of feel-good projects of suboptimal efficacy. If benefiting humanity by increasing existential safety, i.e. Uh, reducing existential risk, achieves expected good on a scale many orders of magnitude greater than that of alternative uh, contributions, we would do well to focus on this most efficient philanthropy. Uh, so again, in yet another paper, he was talking about uh, global pandemics and the possibility of nuclear war and wrote that these would be a, a quote, giant massacre for man, but so long as they did not ultimately prevent us from colonizing space and simulating these people, they would be nothing more than a small misstep for mankind. So one might find this sort of minimizing of such uh, horrors to be a little disturbing. So this is why I find the view so dangerous. Actually, this is just one of many reasons, because this is a short talk. One of many reasons I find the view so dangerous, uh, and I've even suggested that it's the, the most dangerous secular ideology in the world today. Uh, on this view, the future matters more than the present. Why? Because the future could be so much bigger than the present actually is. So my suggestion is that instead we should embrace um, an equivalence view. Again, according to which the badness or wrongness is reducible without remainder to how it, it comes about. Uh, so this doesn't see, on this view, extinction is not a unique moral problem. The difference between total extinction and almost extinction, but we survive, is one of just degree rather than kind. Whereas for the long-termist, it's one of, the difference is one of kind. Um, there's a discontinuity. As the number of casualties increases, once you hit 100%, the badness skyrockets because of that opportunity cost. So I would like to reject that view. Uh, nonetheless, the equivalence view that I would advocate for doesn't imply that we should have a blithe attitude about extinction. So why is that the case? There are two reasons. First of all, by far the most probable way that our extinction will actually come about in the world is as the result of a catastrophe. So, you know, does anybody think, not even antinatalists who, um, who believe we should all stop procreating, think that there is, there is even a remote chance that that's going to happen? Uh, no one believes that everybody around the world is just going to stop having, having children. The second reason is that an ex extinction-causing catastrophe would result in the greatest number of casualties possible. It would be maximally bad, and hence extremely wrong to cause or allow. Omnicide, or the, the murder of everyone, would thus be the worst of conceivable crimes, just as, as Sidgwick said, but for different reasons, not because it would leave trillions of unborn people forever unborn, but because it would harm everybody on the planet, 8 billion people. So I would argue that this is plenty enough reason to take our extinction seriously. The question then is how do we avoid extinction? Well, this sort of brings us full circle. The way to avoid extinction is by, at least in part, is by embracing long-term thinking. Long-term thinking, as I understand it, is a widening of our perspective uh, to include not just the near, but even the more distant future. Long-term thinking is integral to developing and implementing strategies that would help us avoid extinction, literally the worst catastrophe possible. Um, long-term thinking is completely different from long-termism though. Why? Well, if you think that extinction, however it's brought about, would be orders of magnitude worse than a non-extinction extinction catastrophe, you should be willing to spend orders of magnitude more resources avoiding it. But our resources are finite. Therefore, other problems in the world will be neglected, as I mentioned before. So for example, imagine two scenarios. How do you spend your finite resources on, the, on these? Uh, first, there is a catastrophe that will almost certainly cause profound harm for a, a, a duration of two centuries to half the human population, four billion people. Uh, let's just say it's the, the poorest individuals in the world. Two, there is an extremely small probability that a natural phenomenon could destroy humanity instantaneously. More research on this 
phenomenon could lead to a better understanding of its causes and perhaps a way to prevent it. So how then do you allocate the resources? My position says, spend it on the first. The long-termist view would say, obviously, you're going to spend it on, on the second. So in conclusion, I don't know what time it is, but I think we're right on time. Yeah. So in conclusion, I think we should embrace long-term thinking, but I think we should re reject the long-termist view. Uh, we should see the avoidance of our extinction as a top global priority, but not at the cost of neglecting non-extinction scenarios that would cause suffering and harm. Uh, what you should go for instead is, well, for lack of a better term, long long-term thinkingism. Uh, so that is that's my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emil. So uh, uh, we now have uh, time for questions uh, from from the uh, audience, and uh, I've had a few questions come in uh, through the chat. So I'll start with that. And if you have more questions, uh, please post them to the chat. And uh, so I'll start with the question um, from from uh, Chris. Since good or bad is an abstract human concept, if none of us are left in the universe, does that even mean anything? If our genes go extinct, but we pass on all our knowledge and development, for example, through AI um, and a data library, then we might still be around. Yeah, so th this is this gets at that distinction between uh, final extinction on the one hand and what I would call terminal extinction on the other. So terminal extinction is, uh, once again, where we Homo sapiens disappears, and that remains the case forever. It doesn't say anything about whether or not we have successors. Final extinction says that uh, we disappear entirely and forever and have no successors. So it's possible for us to go terminally extinct and still uh, have these, the, create some successor uh, population. And for, for those who think about the ethics of human extinction, that could be extremely important because what matters to them is that our values are further propagated uh, in the in the universe. It doesn't really matter who. The, the substrate of generations doesn't matter. So, you know, you could have Homo sapiens as one substrate, and then we disappear, and then there's some machinic kind of uh, progeny that then instantiates that role of, um, uh, of the substrate of generations. And so, even though we're gone forever, doesn't matter. So Hans Moravec famously uh, held this view. I think a lot of long-termists are pretty sympathetic with it. Uh, there's also been some recent articles in the, the philosophical literature defending, you know, the the passing of the, the baton, as it were, onto our, uh, our artificial progeny, uh, and then us sort of disappearing. The, the thought being that our, our artificial progeny could be uh, much, could live much happier lives, uh, and uh, then we possibly couldn't. So it would be better if we disappeared and were replaced by um, these these other beings. Another thing, so initially when the the first part of the question seemed to gesture at another important idea, which is that can there um, has to do with the nature of goodness. And could it be bad? goodness and badness. So could it be bad uh, if there were no more humans, given that there would be no humans to suffer the badness? Um, and that is that is one view. So that is, in the, the literature, that's called a person-affecting view. So something is, is, is good or bad only insofar as it's affecting people. Uh, then there's this more impersonal view, which is what a lot of the, the long-termists embrace. And that... Um, takes takes a you, you can imagine sort of looking down from the the point of view of the universe itself if that even makes sense Sidgwick was the one who introduced that and actually when he introduced that he said if if that makes sense <laughs> so um you know and the so from this perspective um even if there's no individuals to suffer the non-existence of humanity the fact that we have gone out of, we no longer exist. And as a result, all of the good stuff that the value that we could introduce, introduce in the universe is gone, that that itself would be bad from the point of view of the universe. Does that kind of make sense? So literally on this view, 
as I, I mentioned briefly um, in the, the the presentation, you know, a universe with you know hundred well, hundred trillion uh, individuals is just better, just plain better. Um, it's it's just better simpliciter than a universe with you know just a uh, hundred billion people, assuming that let's say everybody has the same level of of well being. Um, and so, yes, even though there's nobody to suffer our non-existence, it still would be just a terrible thing from this impersonal perspective. I hope that kind of answers the question in a in a somewhat coherent way. <laughs> if you have follow-ups, please, please let me know. If that wasn't sufficiently clear, uh, let me know because I could go into more detail. Okay, thank you. I'll go, we'll go on to the next question. Um, so, um, sorry, this, this, the, just, just keeping track, this, this was the question about the AI and the data library, right? That was the one you were answering, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, good, good. Um, okay. So, so, uh, um, uh, this question from Farley Cates. So we judge extinction in a totally insular matter, manner. We have no way of measuring our human existence relative to other likely life forms that are throughout the universe. So our significance in the universe could well be microscopic in relevance. Yes, to, absolutely. So that that is um, that could that could be the case. There could be you know all sorts of intelligent um, uh, species out there uh, with you know advanced technological civilizations. It might even be that what they consider to be valuable, and hence on a certain view, what they would want to fill the universe with, the kind of value that they'd want to fill the universe with is different than our value. And there, there may be some, uh, maybe they would consider our value to be disvalue. And so, so from their perspective, it would be really bad if then we went out and colonized the universe, spread our value uh, all over the place. And consequently, on the on their perspective, made the universe a, a worse place. So, the, but the one thing I, I would say about this is the possibility of other technological civilizations is definitely discussed by many people in the literature. And, you know, oftentimes it's, it's um, the way to estimate how many technologically advanced civilizations there might be is using the Drake equation. Uh, and there have been some some updates on that, like the Seeger equation. But the Drake equation is sort of the the gold standard here. And depending on what numbers you you uh, insert into the uh, equation, you can get radically different uh, um, estimates. So you know Carl Sagan, um, famously in his uh, uh, 1980, I think, a Cosmos um, documentary, calculated that I can't remember the exact number, but it was just billions of famously, you know, he would say billions and billions. It's just the it's an enormous number of technologically advanced uh, civilizations, which then, of course, leads to the Fermi paradox. Like, why do we see no evidence of these other civilizations out there? But there have been more recent calculations, in fact, by some uh, long-termists based at Oxford, where rather than inserting um, into the equation point estimates, of you know how many stars there are, how many habitable planets, you know, and so on. They they um, used probability distributions, and their conclusion was that the likelihood of there being other intelligent uh, beings in our in, in our particular galactic neighborhood is extremely small. It's like it's just the probability is is very very low, and more generally in the universe, it's still also probably the case that we're alone. So people have sort of thought about this, but the conclusion seems to be that we're likely all by ourselves in the cosmos. And so the consideration that you mentioned uh, is that then becomes less compelling from based on these, uh, these calculations. Thank you. We have a next question, um, multifaceted question about people and cows. So um, it's from Tim Moore, as individuals, we are very averse to thinking beyond the next few years or at the most the death of our grandchildren. Politicians cannot argue beyond their political terms around four years. And so as a result, long-termism is unlikely to be adopted. Cows, on the other hand, are doing very well uh, 
increasing their population by convincing us to eat them. So is that an example of long-termism? And, and the idea of meat-free human consumption actually threatens cows. Are we more valuable than cows? <laughs> That's awesome. Um, yeah, so a couple of things come to mind. One is there was this really interesting study. I think it was published in 2009. Bruce Tong was one of the authors. And they surveyed people and found that um, and I believe this is more or less a quote that the temporal horizon goes dark at about 10 years. So they found that people really struggle to imagine the future beyond just a decade. Uh, even more, as you hinted at, short-termism is built into our institutions. You know, quarterly cycles, you know, four-year, six-year uh, election cycles, and so on. All of this really pre prevents individuals from taking a, a, a long-termist view. Certainly the one of the aims of this big push right now to, uh, to, to increase the visibility of long-termism and to convert you know, people to the, the, the long-termist worldview is to um, get is to, to um, encourage people to, to, to take a longer, view on the future. It's unnatural, it's difficult. But part of their aim is to, uh, you know, yeah, really to, just to encourage people to, to try to take this broader, you know, cosmic perspective. The, the fact is that, you know, our species are, you know, the, the homo genus has been around for something like 2.8 million years, um, you know, going back to, to homo habilis. And you know, in our, our particular species has been around for 300,000 years. Earth will remain habitable for another 800 million years. If we spread into the into the um, universe, we could survive for maybe 10 to the 40 years. That's when protons are estimated to uh, decay, <laughs> at which point that, that would be a hard limit to biological life. So yeah, they're, they're really, I think this is actually one good thing that long-termism is, is doing is trying to get people to like just zoom out of the moment and try to um to place you know human existence right now in a broader maybe even cosmic context uh again that, that's just that's very difficult maybe it's impossible in, in some way maybe our brains just weren't you know designed for thinking on those time scales but also perhaps maybe with practice we could uh, actually get this um perspective so, and I mean, in terms of like the, the cows, um, you know, they, they have done a good job of ensuring that they continue to exist because we like eating them. Um, but yeah, I don't know if that would be long-termism as understood by Bostrom and some of the others. Uh, but, but I mean, also in terms of our value, a lot of the, the, lo the long-termist view in general is not anthropocentric philosophically. In practice, it ends up being anthropocentric. Uh, philosophically, it would say what we are, are we, we adopt a view called sentiocentrism. So it's, you know, the, sen the uh, sources of value in the universe arise from sentience. And, and we have good reason to believe that we're not the only sentient creatures out there. Therefore, value extends beyond the, the things that are valuable, things that matter is not just homo sapiens, but all other creatures that have the capacity for um, consciousness, uh, consciousness, you know, self-awareness, well, maybe self-awareness is, it might be unique to uh, human beings. Mm. But, um, but in practice, that ends up being anthropocentric because the human capacity for sentience is much greater. That, well, so the, the argument goes, you know, we just have these much more complex uh, brains and, and so as a result, then we end up, uh, the focus ends up being on, you know, the preservation of, of humans. But in terms of the, so in that sense, from the sensuocentric perspective, you've got sort of humans up here and cows down here. But obviously there are other, other views, many of which I'm quite sympathetic with. You know, biocentrism says that all, you know, living creatures have uh, value, intrinsic value of some sort. Another view called biospherical egalitarianism says not just that other living creatures 
including non-human uh, uh, organisms, have some intrinsic value, but they, th they have the exact same amount of intrinsic value. So an uh, individual cow has, the, has an identical amount of intrinsic value that, that I have as a human being. And so, I mean, that's another view I'm, I'm sympathetic with. Ecocentrism is the, the, the more radical view that says even non-living things have intrinsic value, value that uh, inheres in those things it, it, themselves, wilderness, uh, um, you know, rocks, rivers, things of that sort. So I hope that didn't down, dance around the, the last part of your question too much, but. Thank you. <laughs> so, um... What is the reasoning that long-termists are using? And I know you're you're not d defending them, but uh, you know if, if you can maybe elucidate on this to, to justify that the idea of a good life for an AI is similar to the idea of a good life for an embodied human. Yeah. So if you take this sentient-centric perspective, that what matters is sentience, and then you accept a view that is at least has been for the past many decades, very popular within philosophy of mind, which is called functionalism. If you put those together, then you the conclusion is that uh, digital minds, digital um, beings, um, you know, si uh, artificial systems that have that um, that have you know have the capacity for sentience um, matter just as much as us. So the the idea in, of functionalism is that you consciousness, sentience is is sort of this higher level property, right? And and ultimately, it is the result of systems, underlying systems that have particular functional organization. That is what matters. So, in philosophy of mind, like there was there was a time when people thought, well, you know, maybe. Maybe there's no such thing as a mind. It's just an illusion. You know, the, the behaviorists held this view. Um, then some came along and they had this, this identity theory and they said, ah, oh, mental states, like a belief, a desire, a feeling. Um, the philosophers would call these uh, quails or qualia is plural, you know, a feeling. Maybe all of these are just identical. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence with a, a an exact kind of functional organization in the brain. So you've got these neurons that are connected in a particular way. And when you get this, there's this particular connection, then you get this, uh, immediately you get this, this kind of conscious experience. Um, and then functionalism came along and said, well, no, it's, it's much more abstract than that. It's just like there are these, uh, these mental states that are identical to functional states. The functional states then can be instantiated by the brain, but the functional states are just these abstract, just, just an organization, um, a, a pattern of information processing. And so therefore the substrate doesn't really matter. So if you take, if you can replicate this functional organization, uh, this functional state on a computer, then you'll get the exact same mental state. Functional states and mental states are identical in this view, as opposed to mental states and brain states mental states and functional states. So doesn't maybe the functional states can be re multiply realized uh, or they're multiply realizable. So all you need to do is get a computer that is uh, complex enough, big enough, some kind of supercomputer that can, can replicate s s mental states of consciousness. Then you suddenly you have uh, a creature that is conscious just like we are. And if they're conscious like, like we are, they can suffer and so on, then they become moral patients. And moral patients, the philosophers would say, the the what it means to be a moral patient is to have moral standing, to be important, to be to be the type of entity that we uh, include within our moral deliberations. And so this is the this is the thinking. Okay, functionalism is probably true, it seems, or at least they would argue there there really kind of isn't a better theory right now. And it looks like we're, you know, um, increasing, you know, uh, computational uh, capacity over time. So at some point, we're going to get to the to this level where the computations are complex enough to instantiate those functional states. And as soon as you do that, you've got a conscious being. And as soon as you have a conscious being, then you should be concerned about them. Uh, 
when you think about what is right or wrong to do. You know, they have the same status ultimately as you know non-human animals, other human beings, and so on. So I hope I hope that sort of <laughs> answered the question to some extent. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a couple time for a couple more questions. Um, this is one is from Yossi Karoff. Um, are we humans in a position to argue what is good or bad for the universe? The arguments and the way to calculate the total bad and the total value are very human centered. And I think very far from what matters to the universe. Our ethics are very human centered and perhaps lack a universal perspective. Yeah, I think it's a great question. Um, it's it is a bit hard to make, and this this is I think supports your point as I understand it. It's hard to make sense of this idea of what of something mattering to the universe. You know, is the universe the sort of thing that that something could matter to it? Is it even the sort of thing that could like have a point of view? Uh, it's not entirely clear, and you're completely right that it could be the case that. There is no fact of the matter about what is valuable in the universe. And you know, so if you're if you're a a realist about value, you might say that there there is value. there's a there 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 is a fact of the matter about what's valuable and what's not. It could be the case that what we think is valuable corresponds to this. could be the case that we're we're off. Or maybe there's just no fact of the matter about what is valuable. There's all there is is what is valuable to us. And if you take that view, then the, the thought that, okay, if we went extinct, let's say because everybody uh, decided not to have children. Uh, so it's not a catastrophe. It's, you know, there's nothing bad about the process or event of, of going extinct. Um, if you take that, that this view, then um, it is sort of uh, perplexing why exactly the one would think that the universe is somehow impoverished by us not uh, existing in it, or is is somehow deprived of something if there isn't you know lots of happiness in the future? So I, I'm, yeah, I'm I'm sympathetic with this with your point. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I have a, um, one last question, and um, it's from France. And France, um, I'm not sure I understand it, so I'm going to read it. And then, um, Emil, if you have uh, um, questions for clarification to France, maybe you could uh, answer. So, so the question is, if past and future are a 3D world's illusion, delusion, wouldn't the idea of extinction of Homo sapiens be included in the relevant hypothesis, but then the extinction itself would be impossible? And wouldn't this idea serve the long-term thinking? Hmm. I think I might get it, but I, I might need a bit more elaboration on it. I th I think it's it's hinting at something very interesting. Franz, can you clarify? Yes, thank you. Um, if uh, if past and future uh, 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 don't exist, maybe um, the uh, Homo sapiens would have already disappeared in the past. Uh, uh, well, uh, it 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 would have happened already if the present didn't exist. Uh, 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 sorry, I lost my uh, my thread. Uh, but it's about uh, uh, if if evolution uh, is is happening. Uh, I think uh, the extinction of Homo sapiens is is a uh, has already happened. So, huh? Um, I mean, there, there, I, I, a number of things come to mind, but I'm not sure any of them would would really answer uh, the question. So, one thing that comes to mind, which may be of interest to, to some people, is this notion of the anthropic shadow. Um, and so I, I don't think that this is a direct response um, to what you, you just said, uh, France, but um, thank you for that. Uh, but th there, there's this idea that that certain certain catastrophes are incompatible, at least within a certain spatiotemporal uh, vicinity, are incompatible with observers like us. 
And this may result in a kind of selection effect, a kind of bias in the historical data. So we look behind us and we see, for example, that there have been no you know, 12 kilometer diameter asteroids that have slammed into Earth in the last thousand years, even the last million, you know, not really since 66,000, 66 million years ago, uh, when the when the dinosaurs died out, has that been the case? But the fact is that if it, so, that may lead us to conclude that oh, maybe we're we're somewhat uh, safe from this particular catastrophe. Maybe it's very improbable. But the fact is that if it happened, you know, a million years ago, uh, uh, definitely a thousand years ago, we wouldn't be here. So there's there's you know behind us there's this anthropic sh shadow which conceals uh, the true probabilities of, of certain uh, events, because if they were to have happened, we wouldn't exist uh, to observe them retrospectively. Uh, and so I don't know, that, that's, this is an, an idea that uh, some of these philosophers who've been thinking about I extinction have used to try to adjust the probabilities of certain extinction-causing catastrophes. So maybe, you know, it could be the case, for example, that a high-powered uh, physics experiment uh, nucleates a vacuum bubble. So this is so it, the idea here is that the universe might not be in the most stable state. Uh, we may be in this this uh, false uh, stable state. Um, well, I should put it this way. So you've got like we're here. This is a stable state in the universe. But in order to get over to the stable state, which is where the universe kind of wants to be. Some some event needs to happen to, to nudge us uh, in that direction. Some people have worried that you know the Large Hadron Collider, for example, could by smashing you know lead ions or whatever it is exactly at ninety nine point nine nine you know percent the speed of light together that that could actually uh, in that little part of the universe uh, nudge it over to a true vacuum state from a false vacuum state. And if that were to happen, it would engender, you would create this bubble that would expand at roughly the speed of light in all directions and destroy everything in its path. So we'd, we'd be gone in just a flash. Um, and so people have wondered like, okay, what's the probability of this? Well, there are like cosmic rays that interact with the atmosphere that do something kind of similar to what's happening in, in the Large Hadron Collider. And none of them have nucleated a vacuum bubble. So it kind of looks like, you know, those, those are happening all the time. So it looks like maybe we're, we're pretty safe from this. And some others have come in and said, well, you need to account for this anthropic bias. Because uh, because may, maybe the probability is fairly high that any one of those uh, collisions with cosmic rays uh, would nucleate this vacuum bubble and destroy us. But if that were to happen, we wouldn't be here to talk about it. So even if the probability is very high, we will always find ourselves in universes where a catastrophe like that hasn't happened in our past. So th this is just riffing off <laughs> some of your ideas as best I understood them. Um, thought that might be of interest. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Richard Dowsett, was was that a, a, a supposed to be an amusing comment or did you want to have it as a question? It could be both. Okay, well, so so this this will this will be our last question. So, in the elegy, of, if there's a fire at a fertility cl clinic, would the long termists save the freezer full of eggs and sperm, or or the human staff? <laughs> <laughs> Just on the it. trolley problem. Yeah, it's. Um, I, so I think they would say, well, you should you should save the uh, individual, the the actual people there, um, not the uh, not the eggs and sperm. Um, but the, the the answer would would not really be all that straightforward because maybe if it were the case that the the eggs and sperm were to to produce more humans in the future with half decent lives, then from the point of view of the universe, it would be better to save them. But they might say, well, okay, if we set a precedent, uh, of saving the eggs and sperm as opposed to the human beings, that would have repercussions in society, which would be bad. And so you, you look at those and maybe overall that would be worse 
than saving the, the eggs and sperm. But I mean, in terms of the, the trolley, um, the, the trolley problem, the, the famous one, I assume like probably most people are familiar with it. It was basically there's there's one uh, innocent person on a sidetrack, straight ahead on the, the um, on the track. There are five innocent people. You can pull the um, railway uh, switch to divert the trolley. What should you do? Most people would say, yeah, we should divert it towards the one innocent person rather than the five innocent people, and that seems right. But from the 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 philosophical theory that gives rise to the long termist view that I was discussing. There is a variant of that, which I think brings out the underlying reasoning. So imagine that there is uh, one innocent person on the sidetrack. On the track ahead of the, the runaway trolley, there are no people. <laughs> but so you're sort of looking at this going like, OK, well, this is, you know, this is an out of control situation, but fortunately, no one is going to die. But then somebody screams and says, like, I can't explain why it's just it's very very complicated and you know maybe you wouldn't understand it but i could with a very high degree of certainty doesn't need to be absolutely certain but just a high degree of certainty if the trolley continues straight uh it will trigger a series of events that ultimately lead to five people in the future who would have good lives and could be born never being born so if it goes straight, these five people will, these unborn individuals will remain unborn. They'll have good lives. Over here, you've got one innocent person who uh, exists right now, and let's say has a has a, a decent life. What should you do? Well, from this sort of long-termist view, you, sh you should pull the railway switch. <laughs> because from the, the point of view of the universe, it would be better if there were five people uh, who had good lives than, uh, you know, just then, then be better the universe if there was one person who was deleted, five people who were added, than if there was one person who remained and five people who never came to exist. So, and then as soon as you start thinking about these future possible people, 10 to the 58, 10 to the 54, you know, 10 to the 45, and so these huge numbers, as soon as you start thinking about uh, those numbers instead of just the five individuals, you can start to see how this reasoning could potentially be really dangerous. Where you know maybe it's not a railway switch; it's the nuclear bomb being dropped on on Germany, uh, or, or or whatever. So, yeah. So good good question and amusing question as well. Thank you. Well, I think we we've come to the end of our questions and the end of the talk. So uh, thanks again to Emil for a thought provoking conversation, and thank you to the audience for all of your thoughtful questions. And um, if if you want to read more. Um, you can follow um, Emil at on Twitter at at X Riskology, which I have uh, posted, and also um, you can uh, check out their website. Um, and um, Emil has a book coming soon, so uh, um, you can check that big out. One. Sorry, like big one, as in like thickness. <laughs> and what and what what's what's the name of the book? It's Human Extinction, A History of the Science and Ethics of Annihilation. Okay. So. <laughs> and uh, great. So uh, um, because of the limitations of Zoom, Zoom, of course, we can't properly applaud, but uh, Zoom has provided a clapping feature. So I invite everyone to show your appreciation by using the clap icon that you can find in the reactions tab at the bottom of your screen. See if I see relies entirely on donations and memberships to allow us to bring you events such as this. Please visit our website, centerforinquiry.ca, or send an email to info at centerforinquiry.ca. For more information about how to become a member or to make a donation. CFIC has a number of events and activities we provide. Um, and uh, um, we have we have had various presentations that you can check out on on our YouTube channel. We also have a podcast that uh, you can check out. And uh, if you want to join our meetup, go to meetup.com slash Center for Inquiry virtual branch. That's where we can get together and uh, have meetings that it doesn't matter whether you're worried about catching COVID and it doesn't matter if you're on the other side of the world or the other side of the country. Again, thank you to everyone who attended and hope to see you again 
at a future event soon. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Take care. Thank <laughs> you.